Hi, this is Kara Swisher, and I want to talk to you about my new podcast for The New York Times called Sway. If you want to know what people who hold power in our world are really all about, you need to hear how they answer the tough questions. And that is my specialty. And although it might get messy, as it always does, it's also going to be really fun. You can get Sway wherever you get your podcasts. New episodes are available Mondays and Thursdays. From NJ.com, this is Talk is Cheap, a New York Giants podcast. We're talking big blue football all year round. Welcome on in, Giants fans, to the latest episode of the Talk is Cheap podcast right here on NJ.com. As always, I'm Matt Lombardo, joined by my friend and colleague, Zach Rosenblatt. And Zach, that was about as disastrous a nightmare on the midway that you could have imagined for the Giants this last Sunday in Chicago with a 17-13 to loss to the Bears. To say nothing about falling to 0-2 with a young quarterback and a young roster, the most consequential loss on Sunday was certainly losing running back Saquon Barkley for the rest of the season with a torn ACL in his right knee. Yeah, it's devastating, man. You know, the, the running the rushing attack wasn't particularly good in the first two weeks, but you still feel better about, you know, a running back's ability to do their job behind a weak offensive line when his name is Saquon Barkley. And now he's out of the fold and, you know, there's, it it just opens up a whole sea of question marks about the future. You know, uh, there's an assumption that he's going to come back. Okay. And I feel like he will just because he's, he's young, he's a freak athlete and he works extremely hard, but like, you just don't know with ACL injuries. Like, so there's so many stories of running backs that were not this, that, that were great after and still like Adrian Peterson, there are ones that were not good after like Jay Jay, who's already out of the league and he suffered his torn ACL, I believe in his third year. Um, or maybe it was his third or fourth, I can't remember. And then he, he was basically done after that. He was never the same athlete after that, and he's out of the league now. So, I mean, you hope, you know, there, there's uh, Saquon comes back okay. But in the meantime, like, this is we, – we've talked about on this podcast many times, like there was already so much working against Joe Judge and this Giants team uh, between this this COVID-infested offseason and, you know, young roster, new offensive line, all these new pieces, new coaches, new schemes. And then on top of that, you remove your best running back and – Sterling Shepard's going to miss at least three weeks, if not more. Uh, so, like, the, the wheels are already almost coming off. And, you know, I'm sure we'll get into this. And you, you have to admire that Joe Judge just kept the team fighting really good. They, they don't seem like a team that's going to go down easy, even if they don't really have the talent to stack up with these other teams. Oh, yeah, for sure. And we're going to get into all of that, all of the long-ranging consequences of Saquon Barkley's injury, what it means for his future, the Giants' future, what it means for Sunday, not just in terms of bringing in Devonta Freeman off the street and playing a banged-up San Francisco 49ers team, but really how this offense has to change. But before we do all that, Zach, of course, a little bit of housekeeping here. Uh, If you love what you hear on the show, we would really love it if you would subscribe in the Apple Podcast Store, give us those five-star reviews, let us know what you like, what you don't like. It helps us grow the show. Go ahead and follow us on Twitter. He's at at Zach Blatt. I'm at Matt Lombardo NFL. And of course, you can follow the show at Talk is Cheap NYG. And if you want to get involved in the podcast, if you want to send us questions, if you want to hear the breaking news first, make sure you go and you sign up for the Giants Extra Text Service. That's nj.com slash text. And we're also heard on Apple Play, uh, YouTube, Spreaker, Google, SoundCloud, all of your favorite podcast platforms. That's where you can find us if you have just stumbled upon us here. Uh, so Zach, let's just get into the Saquon Barkley injury in the short term, right? Because you you alluded to the fact that the offensive line has struggled opening up holes. And I spoke to a couple offensive line coaches and scouts the last couple of weeks who said that, you know, this offense seems to be getting better, this line does in terms of pass protection, but they just can't open up running lanes. And that was evident in the first week where you're playing one of the best, if not the best front seven in the NFL and Saquon Barkley's held to just six yards on 15 carries. He was hit behind the line of scrimmage 11 times. And in the early stages, of the first half on Sunday before he got hurt, Zach Saquon only rushed for 28 yards on 14 on four carries rather. And remember, 18 of those yards came on one run right before he got hurt. So this line really has struggled. And, and Barkley's the type of back who can mask some of those issues. Like you talked about, he's a home run threat. He's a guy who can break off that 18-yard run to look to make the stat line look a little bit prettier, maybe bust out a big play for a score or at least move the chains. Now that element of the offense is just gone. Yeah, you know, the, the offensive line is, is – going to be the biggest question mark and you know I think you you definitely saw them get a little better from week one to week two um you know I talked to Mark Colombo yesterday with the position coaches and he said you know we they were not good enough in week one 
Uh, they haven't been good enough overall, but he, he saw the, the key is progress as a group with a lot of new pieces. You know, Nick Gates playing center for the first time, Ricky left tackle, Kim Fleming at right tackle, blah, blah, blah. You know, Evan Engram isn't really helping as a tight end, as a blocker. So you, you have a lot of things working against them in that regard. And you, you just need to see progress. And there was some, especially in the pass protection, as you mentioned, I think in the second half, they shut down Khalil Mack and Robert Quinn. Uh, but if they don't start opening up holes for this rushing attack, like, I think they did, a, again, they did a better job in the second week, and I don't think Deion Lewis was hitting the holes necessarily. But, you know, I don't think Devontae Freeman is not – we'll get into him more, but he's not the player he once was. He needs a little more help from that line. Um, I, I just envision this team being a kind of a pass-happy offense, like, to the extreme. They have been the first two weeks but out of necessity, out of trailing and all that. I think it, they had 40 pass attempts in both games, I believe, or something I think around 20, that. Yeah, I think 25 of those – passing attempts came in the second half for Jones on Sunday. So again, you're, you're trying to throw your way out of a deep hole in the second half. And you saw them kind of, you know, bring in Caden Smith to chip Khalil Mack through late in the game. They basically threw their hands in the air with Evan Ingram as a blocker and said, okay, we need to start throwing the ball. We're going to line him up in the slot. I think you see more of that, but I just don't know short of making personnel changes and throwing Matt Pert to the fire, your third round rookie and, and, you know, making a switch at center and putting Spencer Pulley in for Nick Gates. I, I don't, now, how you expect this line to just get better overnight, especially when you take away a top five or top ten running back out of that backfield? Yeah, you know, Jason Garrett's really going to have to show if he has any creativity in his in his bones. Um, the first two weeks haven't really indicated that, I would say. You know, they, I think they're last in the league in motion, pre-snap motion. Um, I, I was looking at Daniel Jones's numbers, and on play-action passes, he he's, has like a ridiculous rate. Like the difference between his completion percentage on – play action and non-play action is significant and yet he only threw I believe eight or nine play action passes in week two uh and and like I said he had like 40 pass attempts so I think that they need to get more play action they need to get more motion they need to you know they, they did a lot of Evan Ingram split out as a wide receiver which I think they will do a lot with Sterling Shepard out he's going to be like their slot receiver probably essentially and I, I think so you'll see Caden Smith playing more at tight end and he's a better blocker than Evan Ingram so so you know you're, you're gonna have to see them Shuffling the formation around, trying to get creative, trying to find big plays. They haven't. Even, they've only thrown the ball down the field more than twenty yards, I believe, like two times in two weeks, and that that has That's to wild. change for sure. No doubt about it, especially when you have a deep threat like Darius Slayton, who's probably going to step up and be your number one wide receiver with Sterling Shepard out. And, and that's just it. You look at what happened on Sunday, and you take Saquon Barkley out, and and that's a big enough hit now. Sterling Shepard goes to IR and you're out three to four weeks with turf toe. So you're going to be looking at Golden Tate, who caught five of his six targets on Sunday. Darius Slayton, who had a monster game with two touchdowns against the Steelers and kind of disappeared in week two. And, you know, somebody like CJ Board and moving Evan Ingram to the slot or even out wide. It's going to be a little bit of a patchwork wide receiving core for, for Daniel Jones. And, you know, what was really ironic and kind of disappointing and, and, and it makes you wonder if this Giants organization isn't snake bitten at the moment, Zach, is that, you know, Sunday was the first game in Daniel Jones's career in 15 starts where he had Barkley, Shepard, Tate, Ingram and Slayton all together and all healthy on the field with him, and you lose Sterling Shepard and Saquon Barkley in the first half. So you're not going to have the entire supporting cast around Daniel Jones for the rest of the season. And I talked to Jerry Shaplinski about this yesterday, the quarterback coach, and he basically said that, you know, it would impact an older quarterback much more than a kid like Daniel Jones because an older quarterback and a veteran might be more accustomed to those guys where this uncertainty and this patchwork group is really all that Daniel Jones knows. Yeah, you know, I think, you know, as I think I, I watched the Skoplinski interview. I was in another interview room. They like split up the position coaches, but I watched the Jerry one. And, uh, you know, one of the one of the things he talked about is like everybody's kind of gets distracted by the the turnovers with Daniel, which understandably that's a problem. But it kind of it kind of makes you overlook that he's really fought these last these last two weeks. He's really I know the numbers aren't like amazing, but he he has really impressed me these last two weeks in in terms of his competitiveness and kind of not like being thrown off by struggles or anything like the way he almost led them down the field to win that bears game at the end was really impressive. Um, they're they're going to have to see more of that. He's going to have to be more prolific and he just can't turn the ball over two times per week. Uh, if they want to win any games, especially now that Saquon's not there. Yeah, and of course, in Saquon's place will be Devonta Freeman. We mentioned him a little bit earlier, and you know the Giants signed him to a one-year deal, Zach, worth up to $3 million, and he was on the practice field Wednesday, and now all signs point to 
Devontae Freeman being on the field with the Giants on Sunday against the 49ers. And you have to believe that as much as Deion Lewis picked up the slack in the second half, that Freeman's going to be the guy moving forward. You know, he was basically picking his situation. He was a free agent up until the middle of September, the last week in September, even where he was trying to pick the best landing spot for him. And now he steps in into a potential feature back role. And I spoke to current and former scouts about what exactly the Giants are getting. And to a man, they all said that he's a guy who's probably diminished as a runner at this point. He's still a multifaceted back. He still has reliable hands. He's still a threat to make plays out of the backfield. And that you kind of have that thunder and lightning approach now with Lewis and with Freeman. But if the Giants are going to maximize Devontae Freeman's role, He's going to be better as a pass catcher. And that's an area where I thought, Zach, you would see more of Saquon Barkley. And we just didn't see that through the two games that he was healthy for. Yeah, you know, I, I think Giants fans should temper their expectations of Freeman. He certainly is an upgrade over like what they have. But, you know, he, he suffered multiple injuries in 2018 to his knee and his groin. And like since then, he just hasn't been the same player he was before that when he was a pro bowler, like two straight years. You know, he last year, I think a pro football focus had him as like one of the like 10 worst running backs among guys that had significant snaps. Um, Career low he, yards even as a, carry even last year too. Even, even as a pass catcher, like he gets a lot of catches, but they also he also almost never split out wide like Saquon does. So he doesn't have like the same element of you can move him around. So they're, they're like I said, like Deion Lewis is going to be a guy that's going to play, I think more than people realize after they signed Devontae. But, you know, th this is going to be a full-on rotation is what I would expect. Yeah, I, I agree. It's a backfield by committee where you almost look at what the Patriots have done for the last several years with guys like Sonny Michel and James White just rotating them in and kind of playing to their strengths and maximizing them in their own roles. I could see Joe Judge kind of running a very similar running scheme, and it, it's kind of a departure from what Jason Garrett had the ability to do all those years with Zeke Elliott and, you know, for two weeks at least, trying to build around Saquon Barkley. Uh, but you look at this running game now, again, maybe Maybe Freeman's running style and Deion Lewis's straight ahead running style, maybe that works in this system. But if you can't open up holes as an offensive line, I'm not sure how you're going to spring these guys. And I'm not so sure that you're going to have the kind of success that you might have been able to have with a healthy Barkley where you have that home run threat, because that's just not what either one of these guys are right now. Yeah, you know, I know you mentioned this earlier, but it's just like it's just so wild how we all offseason we talked about how Daniel Jones has never played a game with all of his weapons there at once. And then we get to week one and Golden Tate doesn't play. And we get to week two and Golden Tate plays and they're finally all together on the field at the same time. And it lasts less than 10 snaps before Saquon goes down. Um, and now they might never, because I, I, my, my gut tells me this entire group won't look the same at this time next year. Um, like, of the, like I imagine, you know, one of the Golden Tate, Shepard or Evan Ingram trio will not be back would be my guess. So you, you have, you're just never going to get those guys all at the same time. So Daniel Jones has kind of been working behind the eight ball in that regard where he's they have, the Giants haven't really put him in the position to win because as we've criticized them for, they just didn't bring depth in at wide receiver either this year or last year. And they're kind of like Damien Ratley is going to be playing quite a bit now. And he's a guy that nobody had heard of in New York before two weeks ago. Yeah, and then you look at the offensive line, and it was almost as if it was two years too late to invest a first-round pick in a kid like Andrew Thomas. They've kind of always slapped a Band-Aid on its center, and even when John Jalapio was the starter last year, he was a middle-of-the-road at best center in the National Football League, and then this year you go in with Nick Gates having never played a snap at center before winning that job outright in, in training camp from Spencer Pulley, and you have a Band-Aid for the second year in a row, Mike Remmers a year ago, and this year Cam Fleming at right tackle and you know as much as the Giants have invested a number six overall pick in Daniel Jones it's really been a disservice not to go out and bring in a veteran game-breaking wide receiver or draft one in the first two or three rounds of, of a historically deep and talented draft class at wide receiver and, and yes you had the running back you have a dynamic pass catching tight end but all of the other ingredients that you see other young quarterbacks have look at Patrick Mahomes in Kansas City a great offensive line one of the best tight ends in the league speed at every single single skill position look at Carson Wentz in Philly his second year they go out already with a top five offensive line maybe top three offensive line in the league they bring in Alshon Jeffrey in free agency you look at the the, the Los Angeles Rams with Jared Goff a, a decent enough offensive line they had Todd Gurley at running back they go and get Brandon Cooks a reliable deep threat speedster wide receiver and the Giants decided okay we're going to trade away Odell Beckham Jr. a year before we draft a quarterback we're going to take a quarterback in the first round 
We're going to move forward with taking a fifth round rookie who by all means has exceeded expectations in Darius Slayton, but they haven't gotten that game breaking veteran reliable wide receiver or built out the offensive line in front of him. And, you know, it, it just worries me, Zach, that this offense at its core is fundamentally flawed. And as much as Daniel Jones is gutting it out and he's trying to protect the football and not turn it over, I don't know if he's ever going to reach his ceiling in this situation. Certainly not this. How about that for a hot take? Yeah, certainly not this season. And then, I mean, if you just look at their upcoming schedule, I got there, there, there's not a first, an obvious first win until maybe they play Washington in, in what is it? Week six or week seven. You know, they have San Francisco this week. San Francisco is really banged up. If they were going to catch a team on a bad week, this is the ideal time. Like if they were going to upset somebody, the 49ers are like the ideal team to be playing right now at home. Um, like they're ha- almost their entire roster is hurt. It seems like Nick Bosa is out for the year. Devin Coleman's out. Raheem Mostert's out. Uh, Jimmy G is probably not going to play. Uh, Richard Sherman's not playing. Like it's an unreal amount of in- and George Solomon Gilman's Thomas is out. Yeah. And, and so you have, so the 49ers, even with those injuries, they're still a really talented team and they have a great coach. But th- then you go next week, you have the Rams on the road. They're two and zero. They have some really good talent, obviously. And then the week after that are the Cowboys who are quite clearly the more talented team. And then you have, Washington and Philly back to back. Those are both winnable games, but at that point you could be 0 and 5. Yeah, and it's crazy when you start to think about this that, you know, Sunday, I, I honestly think represents their best chance to get a win over the next five or six weeks because the Niners are just so banged up. And and Nick Mullins was a starter a couple of years ago when the Giants went out to Santa Clara and won on a Monday night. Then again, that was Eli Manning at quarterback, and you had Odell Beckham, and you had Sterling Shepard. Obviously, it's a completely different situation. Saquon Barkley played a key role in the fourth quarter drive. There, there was the comeback to win that game. Barkley's obviously not there but you know this is a Niners team Zach that they were in the Super Bowl a year ago but but you look at how they got there it was primarily with their dominance up front with Eric Armstead Nick Bosa and Solomon Thomas and with Thomas and Bosa out I think that kind of neutralizes that front seven a little bit and then you look at the running back situation without most and without Tevin Coleman as you mentioned that's going to be a struggle for them moving forward here on Sunday so I wouldn't be surprised that this is a really ugly you know herky jerk jerky back and forth offensive struggle where neither team can really move the ball and Jones goes downfield and wins it late for the Giants but you know as you said you bring up Washington I look at their front seven I look at what they did to the Eagles the first week is this offensive line going to hold up against that I mean is Chase Young Chase Young and Ryan Kerrigan are unreal yeah yeah and whether you're putting Chase Young on Cam Fleming or Andrew Thomas I think Young has the advantage there and you look at the other side I mean they just have veteran savvy defensive linemen and pass rushers and you know outside of the Niners I think that the Eagles are the only other real winnable game on this schedule for the foreseeable future yeah and and that's why all of a sudden you know I think you and I were almost overly optimistic in retrospect we didn't know all the stuff that was going to happen um but we both thought they would beat the Bears and then we you know, I think we both had them at like six or seven wins for the season. And if they if they get to six wins now, I think Joe Judge wins coach of the year. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy because you almost revise your expectations now, right? You look at how poor the line is playing. You take Barkley out for the season. You take Shepard out for three or four weeks. If they win three or four games, I think that's a moral victory. But, you know, for as much as we've been down on this team and as much as, you know, the situation looks really dire – I think Joe Judge deserves a lot of credit because a team that loses week one the way that they did and with the quarterback making some really suspect decisions and the turnover down in the red zone at the four-yard line that stopped the 19-play drive that really could have altered that game in the opener to, and then to fall down 17 to nothing or whatever it was in the first half against the Bears to then come out and respond the way they did and have a 50-yard a, a drive come up 10 yards short of, of winning the game – I think Judge deserves a lot of credit for keeping this team together. And, and, you know, if he can keep that up and keep this young team invested, I don't think coach of the year is anything that we talk about seriously. But I think that that's one of those things where in week 17, regardless of who's healthy or not, if you're competitive in these games, I think that's the type of situation where John Merrick can walk out on the field and say, OK, I feel OK about this. Yeah, I, I, I would say as of right now, the most positive thing to come out of the first two weeks is Joe Judge and his ability to have his team playing hard. And I, I I think you feel pretty good about Joe Judge as their head coach. I think you can be more skeptical about, you know, obviously the general manager and him putting together this weak roster and Jason Garrett and some of his like weak decisions and unwillingness to like get truly creative. And I think Patrick Graham has 
you know, he's gotten creative with the defense that has some holes, but at the same time, they've done some questionable personnel things where they're playing guys at weird times. They played Nate Ebner on defense at one point. Um, there was a good point late in the game where they took out Dexter Lawrence and Leonard Williams and, and, and the bears proceeded to get like 20 rushing yards right away. So they're like, there's question. I think Patrick Graham is promising somewhat. I think Joe judge is the story of the first two weeks in a positive direction. And you, you can feel a little better about the giants future. And, and you just wonder if he's going to get a ge- different general manager manager in here, that kind of blows this thing up. Yeah. And that was interesting too, because I spoke to several current agents and um, a former general manager about Saquon Barkley's future, because I think that everything about this season now, if you're looking forward, it's about the development of Daniel Jones and it's about what you do with Saquon Barkley, because if he had been healthy, Barkley's staring down the barrel of a contract extension that pays him between 16 and $18 million and makes him the highest paid running back, or at least puts him in the ballpark with Christian McCaffrey. I I think the biggest storyline is, are the Giants competitive enough at the end of the year where Dave Gettleman remains the general manager going into 2021? Because if he's not, and if John Mara and Joe Judge get together and they say that, you know, this just can't move forward, we're not satisfied with the progress of this roster, we're not satisfied with the progress of this rebuild— I think that really throws a monkey wrench in the thought of Saquon Barkley finishing his career in a Giants uniform because I don't know that a new general manager, whether it's Lewis Riddick, whether it's an Andy Weidel, whether it's anybody, you know, who's up and coming around the league is going to walk in and say, "Okay, I'm going to pay a running back who has missed 20 games or so over the last two seasons, no matter what happens next year as the highest paid running back. I don't know that I value running backs enough to make him the highest paid running back in the league. So if Dave Gettleman is the GM at the end of 2021, I think there's a good chance that Barkley gets that extension going into 2022. But if it's a new general manager, I think all bets are off. What do you think? What do you think they should do with the Barkley thing? Is that, I think the the smart thing, to do would be to wait you know obviously they don't have to do anything with Saquon um for a couple I mean they could franchise tag him after his five-year contract runs out in theory if they wanted to and and all that like I I it just doesn't make any even if Dave Gettleman's here like I that would be very short-sighted to go and give him a big contract unless there's a lot of like stipulations about playing time in games and stuff like that yeah, I think that the fifth year option is a no brainer for them. I mean, you guarantee that that fifth year and it gives him the opportunity to come back in year four and, you know, try to put his best foot forward. And then it, it's, you know, make or break time. Um, I think it all depends if if he comes out and he looks like he did as a rookie and he has twelve hundred rushing yards and, and twenty two to twenty five hundred all purpose yards and he plays 16 or 17 games, then I could see them giving him an Alvin Kamara or Christian McCaffrey or Dalvin Cook type of contract. I think that the, there's nothing really, you know, holding him back from that. But if he struggles and if he gets hurt again or if he misses three or four weeks or he misses a full season, then, yeah, I, I don't know if you even bother franchising him, to be honest with you. I mean, at that point, what are you you're going to pay him top five running back money for a year with no guaranteed salary beyond that? I don't know that his agent is going to be happy with that. I, I don't know that it serves the franchise well. And if if he's become injury prone at that stage, I don't know. I, I don't know that I bring him back. What What about you? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I totally agree. And, you know, this is something that, you know, gets Giants fans upset because it's kind of brought up a lot whenever something goes wrong. But it just kind of goes back to the reason why you don't invest such significant draft picks and running backs because it's just a, such a volatile position. And you can you can get guys in later rounds or for cheaper and free agency or whatever. And your offense can still flow better than if you don't have a good offensive line. Your running back's never going to play. Like, your running back can't overcome a bad offensive line, which we saw in week one. You can have all the talent in the world, which Saquon does. Hi, this is Kara Swisher, and I want to talk to you about my new podcast for the New York Times called Sway. If you want to know what people who hold power in our world are really all about, you need to hear how they answer the tough questions. And that is my specialty. And although it might get messy, as it always does, it's also going to be really fun. You can get Sway wherever you get your podcasts. New episodes are available Mondays and Thursdays. And it doesn't matter if he's not, you know, it doesn't have any space to run. So I I think you're just seeing why that was such the wrong move that year. Um, You know, it's easy to retroactively say stuff. I think a lot of us were saying that at the time. But... And that kind of ties into like whether you should pay the guy, which I, in general I'd say you don't need, shouldn't pay a running back unless they're like a unique specimen, like a 
McCaffrey or even a Barkley. But now that Barkley's hurt, I think that kind of throws it out a window a little bit because now you're 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 playing with risk uh, quite a bit more than you were before because he now he's going to have an injury label because he was he was banged up last year too and he's hurt this year and and uh, you know it's it's going to be very interesting to see how they play this because they they want him to be the face of their franchise and it's going to be harder to make that happen now. Yeah, for sure. I think it's all on him now to be able to stay healthy and, and prove that he can return to form. And, you know, not for nothing, but I think that this this final 14 or so games of the regular season, I, I think that it's an open audition for Daniel Jones. I mean, the Giants can talk all they want about him making progress. And in a lot of ways, I think that it, this has become Daniel Jones's team. I think that the offense rallies around him. You saw that on the final drive last week. You saw it with how they hung tough against the Steelers. But, you know, when you wish – when you look at at Jones, you can't wish away the turnovers. You you can't wish away the poor decision making and some of the the one or two bad throws that he makes per game, or the fact that when he is uh, avoiding the interceptions, that's when he holds onto the ball a little bit longer in the pocket, and that's when the fumbles happen. And again, just like a new general manager, if there is one after this year, is going to need to make an evaluation sooner rather than later on Saquon Barkley. A new general manager is probably going to have to make an evaluation on Daniel Jones, which is kind of astounding. At, at that point, he would only be a second-year quarterback, but I, I believe watching him that he has it in him to erase the turnovers and make better decisions, but the tape doesn't exactly show that. that that's the problem. He, he can make strides in every other department, but if he's averaging 32 turnovers per season, that's just not going to get it done. No, it, it, it's definitely not, and especially – you know, when you have an offensive line question marks, he needs to be able to hold on to the ball at least. You know, he, he's shown signs of, like, improvement in terms of ball security. You saw there was, like, a play where he was running, and he could have reached out to try and get a first down, but he tucked it in instead, which, you know, you're not you're not risking a fumble at that point. So he's clearly, like, the coaching is getting into his ears and it's not going out the other way, which is a positive at least. For sure. Now, how do you think that Sunday plays out? Because I, I've already kind of hinted that, I really think that the Niners are more banged up. I think that they're missing too much talent that they rely on at too many critical positions to how they win football games. But how do you see Sunday playing out? Yeah, you know, I, I think ultimately I think Kyle Shanahan is just a stellar play caller, and I think Nick Mullen has been okay in the past when he's had a play. Um, and so I, I just think Kyle, you're you're looking at Kyle Shanahan versus Jason Garrett, really, and I think Shanahan has the edge there. and. The 49ers even banged up their defense is still pretty talented. Um, so I, I still had – I think I predicted the 49ers winning 27-20. to 20. I think it's going to be another game that comes down to the end. I, I fully expect the Giants to be in this game. And, you know, I think that we're going to see a lot of things that are going to be coming out of this, thinking the Giants can feel good about themselves. Um, I, I don't think Stevante Freeman is going to be physically ready to play as much as maybe everyone thinks he will by Sunday, considering he didn't have a training camp. So it's going to be a lot of Deion Lewis, and that means they're going to – kind of telegraph that they're passing the ball a lot because I don't think you can trust Wayne Gallman really uh, as a runner at this point. So I, I, I think it's going to be a close game. I think it's going to be a fun game, but I just don't see the Giants pulling it off. Yeah, see, I think that when you look at the roster top to bottom, I think the Niners are more talented than the Giants. I think they certainly have more depth. But I just look at the critical players that are that play such key roles in how they win games, rushing the passer, running the football. Um, you bring up a great point with Kyle Shanahan against Jason Garrett. You're talking about one of the best and brightest and most creative offensive minds in the NFL against Garrett, who when you look at the trend numbers and you look at some of the things that have taken place over the last couple of weeks, you brought up the lack of pre-snap motion you brought up the lack of play action passes that have obviously you know would would have helped Daniel Jones had you done those things more I think it puts the Giants even a little bit more beyond behind the eight ball but something just tells me that this defense that hung so tough against the Steelers played so well in the first half against the the, the Bears there has to be a breakthrough moment at some point and I, I don't know that you can keep being happy with moral victories and I think that this could just be the week where the Niners are so banged up and losing so many key pieces that this might be the week the Giants are able to take advantage yeah you know like I said if you just look at the schedule this looks like the most winnable game between now and the Eagles game uh, I guess between now and the Washington games, I think that one's winnable, even if the, it'll be a tough one. Um, so if, if they were ever going to get an upset, you know, they're still underdogs technically. Um, I, I would I would say this would be a good week to bet on them um, I, I, until I see them kind of like pull it off at the end. You know, the good teams are able to do, 
you know, they're able to complete the comeback as opposed to That's just a great starting. point. So until they show me they can do that, I just don't see it happening yet. No, I agree. But I think that if anybody is going to play a key role in this game on Sunday, I think on offense and defense, on the offensive side, I think it's going to be Evan Ingram. And, you know, you talk about Earl Thomas and him being a little bit banged up. You know, if you can create that matchup and you can get – Ingram the ball in open space. I think that that's a guy that can make one or two plays that gets the ball rolling for the offense. And then on the defensive side of the ball, you know, I, I love what I've seen out of Lorenzo Carter. I mean, he's a guy who seems like he's just generating all kinds of pressure. He had the sack last week, seems to be really taking up residence in the backfield. If he can knock Nick Mullins around, maybe force a fumble, I think he's the type of guy that can make the type of play in a close game that can alter the outcome. Yeah, you know, on, on that note, like a couple guys, I mean, Evan Ingram, I think, is an obvious one, especially because, like I said, I think he's going to be like the slot receiver, essentially. I think Nick Gates is a guy of my eye, and I think he improved quite a bit in week two. Um, he's going to have to have a good game. You know, they still have uh, some talented defensive linemen, uh, like I said. And then on, on defense, that second cornerback spot is kind of going to be the key because last week in the week, in week one, the quarterbacks were targeting that area of the field, and they were successful. It seems like Isaac Yaidome is the one that's kind of taken over that job. He played more than – Ballantyne did last week, especially after Ballantyne gave up that bad touchdown, really bad. Um, so I, I think we're gonna have to, if Isaac Yadom can be, you know, even an average player, at, even a little bit below average, that would be an upgrade over what they've had. And I, I honestly think they'd be two and zero if they had a better second cornerback. Right now, there's just there's just so many times where they just target that side of the field. James Bradbury is even better than I thought he would be. He was amazing last week. Um, so Maybe if if, 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 if Yadom can be average, they, they can win this game. Yeah, I watched James Bradbury last week, and I wonder if that's not the strongest game of his career. And it certainly was the type of performance the Giants had in mind when they signed him. I mean, he basically traveled with Allen Robinson most of the game, and he had one interception. He had the pass breakup that caused another interception. And then he also had a breakup where he read Trubisky's eyes, jumped the route perfectly. And, you know, you can make a case that if the Giants had won that football game, that James Bradbury might have been the defensive player of the week in the NFL. He was that good and that that dominant and if you get that type of performance out of him every week you have to feel good about the secondary and I think that you know little by little each game we're going to see the Giants bring along uh, Logan Ryan a little bit more and maybe you start to see more of Darnay Holmes a little bit in the slot but I, I'm not I wouldn't be surprised Zach if we've seen the last of Corey Ballantyne as a starter because teams are just finding Ballantyne and going right at him time and time again week after week. Yeah, I thought it was interesting today, just to tie to the cornerback point, that Ross Cockerell, who was supposed to sign here and then uh, asked for too much money after he had already agreed upon a contract, and so they didn't sign him, and he would have started week one and been better. Now he just signed with the practice squad with the Buccaneers, I believe. So it seems like he made a misjudgment on trying to demand more money out of that, and they could really use a guy like that right now, honestly. Yeah, you have to wonder if the Giants won't try to poach him off of the Buccaneers practice yeah, squad, but there's, pro there's probably so much ill will between the organization and Cockrell for how those negotiations broke down at the 11th hour, but 11th hour rather. But you think about how much the secondary might have been different. You could probably still go out and sign Logan Ryan if you plan on using him at safety yeah. after Xavier McKinney goes down. But you could have had Cockrell and Bradbury at both corner spots. You could have had uh, Darnay Holmes in the slot, and then you would have had – Logan Ryan and Jabril Peppers in the backfield. And I think that that secondary is tremendously more talent with more upside than what the Giants are trotting out there now. Yeah. And, you know, and, and Julian Love, by the way, also would, would have been the third safety there. And he's, he's, yeah, he's looked pretty good. I, I think Jabril has actually been a little bit of a disappointment so far. But if you maybe take a little, little of the responsibility away by having such a deep secondary, then I think he's better suited anyway. Zach, what's your pick for Sunday and any parting shots here? Uh, yeah, I got. I have the 49ers going 27 to 20 with the win, um, and and I, I I just keep an eye on. I know every, for fantasy purpose, everybody's looking at that running back uh, rotation. I I wouldn't expect Devonte to be the bell cow that maybe you're probably bid on him for, like in your fantasy leagues. I think it's going to be pretty close to a 50 50 split. They like Deion Lewis maybe a lot more than people realize. I think especially because he's good in pass protection and as a receiver. So I, I think it's going to be a 50 50 split, and maybe you see Gallman getting the occasional carry too. 
See, I think the Giants get it done on Sunday. I know that I was wrong. I picked the Giants to beat the Bears last week, and I was 10 yards shy from, you know, getting that pick right. I just have this suspicion that that the Niners being so banged up and the Giants showing so much fight the last couple of weeks that I think it's going to be ugly, like I said. I think it's going to be an offensive slog fest. I wouldn't be surprised if both teams turn it over a couple of times. But I think Daniel Jones actually gets the fourth quarter comeback drive this time i think they go down the field they win the game something like 17 to 16 something just ugly and low scoring and uh if i'm gonna make a bold prediction i I have nothing that tells me that this could happen but i think you see a change along the offensive line this week whether it's nick gates being pulled for pulley or whether it's fleming being you know swapped out for matt pert i think the giants need to do something to spark that offensive line because it's just been inadequate the last couple of weeks yeah, the, the the right tackle spot in particular is where I have my eye, and I wonder if they would even move Nick Gates out to right tackle and put Pulley in or something like that. Because I I don't know yeah. if Pert, Pert will be an upgrade necessarily, but like I'd be interested to see how they handle that. Yeah, and I think that Gates, after what we've seen, I think that he'd, he'd actually be better suited to play right tackle. So Zach, you have a loss. I have a Giants comeback win. We'll see how it plays out. It should be a fun afternoon at MetLife. Yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to getting back up there, even if we're going to be six feet apart in the press box. (laughs) And and we get to avoid the turf monster, too. So there's always that. We won't get to our ACLs. All right, everybody. He's Zach Rosenblatt. I'm Matt Lombardo. Give Zach a follow on Twitter. You need to get that following up for Zach. It's at Zach Blatt. I'm at Matt Lombardo NFL. Zach, I'll see you Sunday. All right. See you Sunday, Matt.